That's okay. All right. We are talking today with John Hedrick of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, John, start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? Well, I was born in Wichita, Kansas, but I grew up in Newton, Kansas, which is 18 miles north of Wichita. Okay. What year were you born? Uh, 1930. Okay. Uh, you grew up in, in Newton, and uh, what did your family do for a living when you were growing up? <laughs> My uh, grandfather was an inventor, and he had, I think, 17 basic patents on various devices for poultry and hogs and farm products, mm -hmm. in other words. And so uh, we sold, our big item was cardboard baby chick feeders because during the war, uh, steel was not available for the, the feeders. And so the cardboard, we sold over a million one year, uh, which is a lot of, lot of cardboard. Mm -hmm. But they were, uh, th this was made for us, or the feeders were made in St. Joe, Michigan by a paper box company. Uh, and I worked uh, after school uh, folding and mailing $1 orders for baby chick feeder. We'd sell four for a dollar, mm -hmm. and that would feed 100 little baby chicks during their gestation period. All right. Um, so my dad was in the business. Just to back up a little bit, you were born in 1930, and that's that's during the Depression. Yes. Uh, now in the 30s, now let's see. So were you living with your grandfather as well as was your, or was your, how good, did that work? Good question, Jim. Yeah, we moved in with my grandparents mm -hmm. in about 1929, mm -hmm. about a year before I was born, and I remember uh, I have a brother who's six years older and he recalls the phone ringing at two o'clock in the morning and granddad answered it and then he said mercy 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 <laughs> he got off the phone and said Florence has had twins so I had a twin sister mm -hmm. uh, right. we lived with my grandparents for probably close to a year mm -hmm. and then bought a house in Newton and lived there the rest of our lives. Okay. So basically the in inventing business went it went well enough that you could that they could support the family yeah, uh, very during well. the 30s. Very very well. Okay. All right. Now do you remember uh, hearing about Pearl Harbor? Oh yes. How did you learn about that? Heard it on, on the radio. Of course everything was radio in those days but uh, yeah, that was a pretty dramatic time probably didn't realize the full impact of that attack, that it would lead right into war and all, but uh, certainly remember it. Okay. Now, did the oncoming of the war, I mean, it, it, it generated more business, but otherwise did that change the way of life in, in Newton, or did things stay pretty much the same when you were growing up? Well, a lot of young men were called into service. Mm -hmm. um, in 41, I was only 11, Right. so I had to wait until I actually went to college and graduated from college and then went into the Navy. All right. And where did you go to college? University of Kansas. Okay. Jayhawk. All right. All right. Now, um, land-grant schools had an ROTC requirement, so Kansas State had one. Uh -huh. Did you do ROTC at Kansas or did you just decide to volunteer after you finished? That or? was exactly right. I did, they had ROTC, but I didn't join it okay. at Kansas. Um, seven of us from our fraternity went over to Kansas City. We had heard that they had reopened the Naval Officer Procurement, uh, the OCS school, 16-week mm -hmm. school, mm -hmm. to get a, an officer, become an officer. So seven of us went over and applied, all passed, all went back to Newport, Rhode Island. All right. Now what year was that that you did this? 52. Okay. So the Korean War I'm, was I'm on at that time. I apologize, Jim. That yeah. was 51. Okay. Uh, yeah, the Korean War was pretty hot at that time. I was number one on the draft list. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Carrie Nation was our draft officer, and 
I said, well, what do I do? And she said, well, you'd better enlist or I'll have to pull you into the Army. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, I'll enlist. So I enlisted in the Navy and went back to San Diego to boot camp for about seven weeks awaiting orders to go to Newport, Rhode Island, where the school was. All right. Talk about boot camp. What did you do there? <laughs> a whole lot of exercises. Uh, it was a great experience, really, because I learned a lot of fundamental things about naval protocol, and um, it, it stood me in very good stead for becoming an officer. Okay. And when you were doing your boot camp, was your... Uh, the unit you were training with, you, were you all officer candidates or did you, or were you in with the ordinary guys? No, in with ordinary guys. I remember one young man came from Arkansas, didn't have a suitcase, didn't have anything, didn't have a toothbrush. And he just arrived. <laughs> so they, they gave him a toothbrush and cut his hair and fixed his teeth. He had terrible dental problems. Mm -hmm. But that was typical. We had an awful lot of, you know, young men from the hinterlands at boot camp. Okay. Now, were there any black recruits in that class, or were you all white? Jim, that's a wonderful question. We had no blacks in our squadron. Mm -hmm. and I was. They made me squadron commander because I had a college degree. Mm -hmm. um, Later on on the ship, of course, we had blacks, and I was became good friends with a lot of them, uh, but not. Uh, but not not with the training group. Yeah. Not in the boot camp. Yeah, because uh, they, the military was still sort of transitioning into being integrated. The order had come out a few years earlier. Truman had desegregated the military officially. Right. But it, it took a while for that to it kind sure of did. filter through. Uh -huh. All right. Okay, so uh, you do your seven weeks of boot camp, and then Newport, Rhode Island is the next stop? Yes. Okay, what do you do there? Sixteen weeks of very intense schooling and training. Uh, we, uh, we studied the, all of the naval uh, information that uh, people at, uh, what am I trying to think of here? Um, hmm. Oh, shoot. What's a school, Navy school? Annapolis. Mm -hmm. We studied the same curriculum in 16 weeks that they studied in four years, mm -hmm. as far as the Navy's concerned. Right. Uh, so it was very intense. Uh, and a great, great experience. All right. Uh, and at what time of year were you there? March. Okay, that could be interesting in Rhode Island. Um, yeah, we hit some snow, uh, but we graduated in, uh, let's see, March, April, May, 16 weeks would be June. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, now, how easy or hard was it for you just to adjust to being in the military? Did you adapt to military life quickly, or was it a challenge? No, I think I adapted very quickly. I tell you, living in a fraternity at Kansas uh, was good good background for going into the military because I'd learned to live with other guys and sleep in dorms and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it was a it was a good background. All right. Uh, and what kinds of people were training you uh, at Newport? Were these old, better, old veterans or...? Mostly Navy chiefs. Okay. Yeah, older guys. They, they seemed older at the time. They probably were in their late 20s uh, or early 30s. Uh, but we had wonderful training. Gosh, I just uh, really treasure what we learned back there. Okay. And now once you complete this, what do they do with you? Uh, when I graduated mm -hmm. from OCS, they assigned me to the AGC-12, the USS Estes, which is an amphibious group command ship, and it was uh, based in the Pacific. I had requested Pacific duty, and so I got the AGC. 
All right. Now, describe the <clears throat> a AGC as, as a ship. How big is it? What does it look like? 368 feet long, uh, 60 feet wide. Uh, it's a converted APA, which is a uh, cargo ship or, or mm -hmm. troop carrying. Yeah. yeah. Um, they made me uh, assistant gunnery officer. We only had one gun mount on the ship, mm -hmm. and assistant navigator. And the first thing we did when I went aboard, uh, I, I said, you know, what's up? And they said, well, we're going out to Anahuitoc for a, some kind of a bomb test. And none of us knew very much about it at the time. It was really top secret. We were in a race with Russia in the Cold War. So we went out to Inuitok, sat in, in the atoll for about six weeks. I went scuba diving and snorkeling every day, uh, waiting for the scientific test of the H-bomb. Mm -hmm. um, the morning of the test, we were 38 miles upwind from the <coughs> from the bomb site, which mm -hmm. was in a, a shack on an island, Elujabag or something like that, mm -hmm. it was a weird name, uh, which ceased to exist after the test. The island just disappeared. Yeah. So this is a coral atoll, so there's a bunch of small islets in kind of a ring around a exactly, lagoon. Exactly. And so, and so this was on one of them, so it didn't destroy the entire atoll. Oh, but no. It, but it blew up that it island. It blew up that island, right, because mm -hmm. the atoll is made up of all coral reef and then islands periodically. Okay. Now, when they actually set off the bomb, uh, do they allow people to watch it, or do you have to look in a different direction while the blast happens? Or? I had to look in a different direction. Uh, I was assistant navigator on the AGC, so I was up on the bridge, um, but they didn't have enough high-density goggles to give me a mm -hmm. pair, so I had to stand there with my head in my elbow until they said, you can look now. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, absolutely incredible. Uh, the fireball went 50,000 feet high, and it was a mile wide. It was three times as hot as the center of the sun. And it literally vaporized everything for one mile of width and 175 feet of depth. Which, you know, if we took right here, that would be almost to uh, Burton Street uh, on the north and division on the, on the west. So that's how big the fireball was. Mm -hmm just gigantic. It was much larger than they anticipated. I actually tested out, they wanted about six or seven megatons of explosive. They got about 13 okay. megatons. So, now, Was this the first hydrogen bomb test? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they really didn't know what was going to happen? So it was Absolutely not. Right. No, it was all uh, calculated. I don't want to say guesswork, but mm -hmm. it was, uh, and some of their instruments were actually destroyed by the severity of the blast. Now, did you feel the shock itself when the bomb went off? No. Okay, so did the no, water we, uh, absorb that, or? Uh, probably, Jim, about two minutes after the, the thing went off, a shock wave came across the surface. Mm -hmm. But it was a very mild by then, 38 miles, you know, mm -hmm. we were, it had dissipated a whole lot. Right. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so you join the Navy and walk into a little piece of history right away. Oh, it was, it was amazing. And then uh, a week later, they set off a smaller nuclear bomb only about two miles from us. Mm -hmm. And that really rocked the ship and did some damage and got us uh, quite a few rentkins of, of uh, what do we call that? Well, radiation. Radiation, yeah. that's correct. Uh, so why were they doing that? They, uh, 
they detonated the hydrogen bomb mm -hmm. with a small nuclear bomb. Right. And they they needed the nuclear bomb to get the get hot enough to detonate the, the hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And so they were experimenting. Uh, and it was it wasn't that big of a a gamble, I guess. They they kinda knew what they had. Yeah. But it still sounds like it was bigger than it should have been, or if you were that close to it. Or in those days did they just not think that much about safety and We safety? didn't. Uh uh. I remember seeing the plane and hearing bombs away. You know, and watching and watching, and suddenly the thing exploded, um, probably 2,000 feet up in the air. Well, it showered us with a lot of radiation and broke some antennas and mm -hmm. that kind of surface damage. One young man, unfortunately, was going through a hatch when the thing went off, and it, the hatch broke his arm, slammed it shut. Uh, but that was a fascinating experience. Here I was, you know, just a green young ensign, uh, but got to be up on the bridge with mm -hmm. officers and, and uh, congressmen, generals. Mm -hmm. We had a real uh, entourage of, of people out there to, to observe that test. Okay. Now what did the, uh, how long did you stay on that ship? Well, that's a good question. We went from there, went right back to Mare Island, which is just north of San Francisco. It's a big Navy shipyard mm -hmm. to repair some of the damage that had been done to the ship. And <laughs> we got uh, involved with some Stanford girls. And one of our, one of my shipmates lined up these girls to take us skiing up at Squaw Valley. Mm -hmm. and one of the girls' folks had a cottage up there. So I learned to ski, rudimentary, mm -hmm. very, from being from Kansas, we didn't have any hills in Kansas. But uh, it was a great experience. We, we would go almost every weekend, go up and ski. Uh, and then, uh, then I got emergency orders to report to the LST 914, which was down in Long Beach, California. Okay, so roughly when was it that you changed ships? In, uh, January of 52, okay. yeah, 52. All right. So how long in total were you uh, with your first ship? Was that a, just a few months then? Yeah, less than a year, about nine months. Okay. All right. Well, before we move on to the LST, let's talk a little bit more about life on an AGC. Uh, what was, when you were out at sea, what was the daily routine? Well, I was assistant gunnery officer and assistant uh, officer of the deck, or a first lieutenant, mm -hmm. which is, is in charge of the deck and the painting and all of those things. Um, and it was really uh, a good experience. I had uh, a division of workers that, that I was supervising and we played a lot of bridge and had a lot of fun on that ship. Were there rules about sort of the kinds of interactions you could have between officers and enlisted? Okay. So you, Not could, really. you, you could play bridge with enlisted personnel? Didn't, didn't. Okay. Uh, no, I no. played with the dentist and the, the navigator and mm -hmm. another guy. All right. So the officers kind of would, would still on some level stay together. Yeah, we had a wardroom. Mm -hmm where we ate and uh, kind of lounged. Uh, no, we didn't have a lot of contact other than once you got out of the boardroom and out on the ship, mm -hmm. uh, then you had a lot of contact. Okay. Now, you had mentioned before you had black sailors in the crew. Did you have black sailors doing anything other than working as cooks or stewards? <laughs> Uh, we had a couple in our deck gang mm -hmm. doing chipping and painting and so forth. Uh, we had a couple in the uh, uh, the 
kitchen, as we call it. Uh, we had one who, in our little wardroom, which was our officer's hangout, we had one assigned to us right. daily to prepare meals and service and do all of that. Uh, so it was a yeah. So that was the tradition. That was the traditional role for black sailors. But the ones who were in the deck gang, that was actually something relatively new. Yeah, it was. Uh, we had one by the name of Sap, S A P. Who <laughs> I always say he looked like Stephen Fetchett. Real loose land. Mm -hmm. We had a collision with another ship, and the bow of that ship penetrated ours came right into the, the guy, the head, as we called it, the bathroom, mm -hmm. and Sap had just gone off duty and was sitting on the john when that bow of that ship came, penetrated, broke a steam line, and I'll bet he's still telling that story today. <laughs> yeah. yeah, great, great guy. All right, uh, what kind did you what, what was the work routine for you in terms of how long do shifts last or when were you on or off duty? Uh, yeah, I stood watches as an officer of the deck. Uh, we had six officers, so we, would, we rotated. Mm -hmm. um, stood watch about every two days. We'd stand for four hours, and of course we were there all through the night. Mm -hmm. Uh, during the day, uh, just kind of supervised the deck gang, and and then uh, our uh, executive officer, who was a full lieutenant, uh, left the ship, and they made me the executive officer, which was wonderful because then I stood no watches of any kind, mm -hmm. uh, and it really. Uh, was a great experience. Did the uh, did that ship have any other missions or things that it did while you were on it except the trip to Anuitok? Yeah, we would uh, go out on training cruises, uh, do uh, mock invasions, go up and hit the beach and open our bow doors and lower the ramp. Um, <laughs> the protocol for that as you went into the beach was to drop the stern anchor which you could then use to help pull you off the off the beach. Okay. Now did the AGC have doors in front of it like an LST or a ramp that, full, that came down? No, the AGC was just a ship. Okay, so you would stay offshore. I, I'm on the LST now. Oh, okay. Now I was still asking about the AGC. Oh, I'm sorry. While Tim. you were on that, because we kind of we'll cover that and then we move on to life on the yeah. LST. Okay. So with the AG, now the AGC was a, a command ship for amphibious operations. That's correct. Now while you were with the AGC, did you do any exercises? Or was the only thing you did with them go to Anahuitoc and then come back? That was basically it. Okay. Uh, because by the time we got there, we were out there about three months, mm -hmm. came back in the shipyard. Right. And I left the AGC yeah. while it was still in the right. shipyard. Right. Okay. Now that gets us. Uh, now where was the LST when you joined it? It was uh, Long Beach, California. Okay. Uh, and when I went down there, then they sent me right to San Diego to a couple of schools, really. Um, one was on ice navigation. What, what do you do when you're in the ice? Because uh, we, were, we were going to the Arctic for a resupply expedition of the Dewline defense bases all around the northern coast of Alaska mm -hmm. and clear over into Canada. But we were in the ice for 17 days. Um, as I mentioned, they had reinforced our bow doors and the stern so we could actually push the ice. Um, we operated with two ice breakers, a Burton Sound and can't even think of the name of the other one, but they, uh, they were our protection in case we got in real trouble. North Wind was right, the okay. other one. Now, when they put you on the LST, I mean, what is your assignment on that? What's your job? 
first lieutenant, which means I was in charge of the whole deck force, mm -hmm. also a navigator. Okay. And how many officers did they have on an LST? Six officers, 120 men. Okay. All right. Uh, and so you talked about getting ICE training. What did that involve? Really very, very little. Uh, they, we were testing some foul weather gear because Korea was still on mm -hmm. at the time and we had a lot of, a lot of suffering in Korea from the freezing. Uh, so we were testing uh, alpaca lined coats. Um, but that was about it. It was a very easy duty. Mm -hmm. uh, just sailed up, stopped at Port Wanini, stopped in Seattle to take on supplies, and then went on up to the Arctic. Point Barrow. Mm -hmm. uh, was and who was at Point Barrow? The USS Estes was waiting there in charge of that group. All right, so your old ship is up there. My old ship was there, yeah. Right. Okay, uh, now I guess describe a little bit what you're up there, the resupply mission, so how does that work or what do you do? Well, basically, uh, we took on about 50 stevedores at Port Wanini, and they rode up with us into the Arctic, and they basically did the unloading of everything mm -hmm. at the, the site of a new dewline base. We carried uh, high-octane fuel, um, a lot of electronic gear. Our main deck was just covered with supplies for that. Um, we, uh, we were on the beach, as it is. We roll up to the beach mm -hmm. and open the bow doors and lower the ramp. And then they take the uh, supplies out through the, through the tank deck um, and left them there. We were, I think, either three or four days during the unloading process. Had a lot of, lot of stuff to unload. Mm -hmm. So how do you spend your time while that's going on? Fishing. Uh, I did an awful lot of fishing and hunting when I was, grew up in Kansas. Mm -hmm. And I had a, a fly rod and I probably hiked up about a mile on this little stream and never caught a fish. Mm -hmm. Never saw one. Got back to the ship and they said, boy, you should see the fish those guys caught out in the bay. Oh. <laughs> Big silver mm -hmm. fish. Uh, but I, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. My dad had given me a, about a dozen rolls of film. He was quite a photographer. Mm -hmm. And I took a lot of pictures. Got home, had them developed. Didn't have a single picture. The film was all out of date. Oh. A bad experience, because I really uh, had some treasures as far as photography. We saw a herd of caribou, mm -hmm. probably a thousand caribou in this big herd. And we watched them, I photographed them, you know, and I was really excited to get home and show everyone those, but not to be. Okay. Were there any people up there? Yes. Uh, we pulled up <laughs> to this one site and pulled up t to the beach, didn't open our bow doors or lower the ramp, we just sort of sat there on the sand and there were probably a, probably a 25, 30 foot high cliff right in front of us, a cliff and down to the water. Mm -hmm. There were dozens of dogs lining <laughs> lining the bank up on mm -hmm. the, there, which was pretty exciting. We didn't want any part of those dogs. So we ultimately backed off and went down to our site. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was a, an Eskimo village. Uh, we were on the north shore of Alaska at that time. Mm -hmm. We got as far east as the uh, Mackenzie River, uh, which would have been in Canada mm -hmm. rather than Alaska. Right. 
So we went around quite a ways. Okay, so you're part way through the Northwest Passage. Yes, yes we were. Yeah, it was, that was a fascinating experience to go up there. I really uh, treasure my time. Okay, now once that mission is complete, what do you do next? Uh, went back down to San Diego and uh, for a little R&R &R, and then went to Japan and spent a year out in Japan. All right. Now, where were you based in Japan? Yokosuka. Mm -hmm. It's a major naval base. Yes. Uh, the Tokyo Bay or that area? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. That's exactly right. I was navigator. It took us 32 days to get there. Mm -hmm. But we hit Tokyo Bay right on the nose. So. All right. Uh, now, and so did you spend, um, did you just stay on the ship or did you go ashore much or what did you do in Japan? Well, I went ashore. I took two automobiles, took a Chevy and a Ford, out to Japan, mm -hmm. aboard the ship, uh, sold the uh, Chevy the day after we got there for exactly double what I'd paid for it in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And I was going to sell the Ford, and I thought, no, I'll, I'll do some driving. So I drove over 2,000 miles in Japan over the period of the next 10 or 11 months. All right, so where did you go? What did you see? A whole lot. Went up to uh, Mount Fuji, uh, went down the coast to Nagoya, which is the big uh, pottery uh, place. I was had my shotgun with me as well as my fishing tackle. So I went out pheasant hunting. Uh, I didn't get one, but I, I saw an old Japanese guy with a shotgun and he got one. Mm -hmm. uh, so, But it was fun. I went out into the countryside, which I would never have had a chance to do if I would not have had the car. Okay. Now, did the Japanese drive on the wrong side of the road? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. And that's an exercise to reorient your thinking particularly when you're making a left turn or a right turn, that's where you get disoriented. So did you uh, hit anything or did you? Never did. Okay. No. Uh, now, what kind of condition was Japan in, towns, countryside, X number of years after the war? Well, that would have been in 54. Yeah. Uh, so nine years after the war. Mm -hmm. Yokohama was still devastated. Awful lot of rubble. They just hadn't rebuilt it in nine mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. um, Tokyo, pretty decent shape. Uh, yeah, it was the attitude of the Japanese towards us was just remarkable. They were extremely warm and friendly and uh, uh, just couldn't have been better. Mm -hmm. So I learned a little Japanese, <laughs> enough to be gracious. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a great experience. All right. Uh, so how much time did you spend in port as opposed to being out at sea during that year? We probably spent uh, about 80% of our time in port. Mm -hmm. um, we did a couple of operations. One was down at the, right at the foot of Mount Fuji. We did a mock invasion there. We had Marines on board and uh, did a mock landing and, and invasion there, um, which was very interesting. We pulled in there when it was dark and then watched the sun hit the top of Mount Fuji and then work its way down down the mountainside. It was just a beautiful sight. So that was that was very special. Okay. Now, when you're an officer on a ship like that, I mean, do officers have to do shore patrol, or are they responsible for men who go ashore and get in trouble, or, or do the nope. petty officers do that? No, we didn't do any of that. Um, 
later on in the reserves, I acted as a shore patrol in Jamaica. Uh, that was interesting. Uh, but we didn't do any, any of that type of thing. All right. Now, um, if you're spending a lot of time uh, in, in port, in a place like Japan, and have a bunch of 19, 20 year old guys aboard, uh, did some of them get in trouble while you were there, or was everyone well behaved? Some of them got in trouble. Um, our captain required every returning sailor to take a penicillin. Mm. He said, I don't want any VD on our ship, you know. <laughs> But uh, he was quite a guy, our, our skipper, hopeless alcoholic, but, but a great uh, ship handler mm -hmm. and uh, he became a good friend. Okay. Was he a World War II veteran? Or yes. Was he? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He was. And Lou Stillwell, often thought of him. He was married and had a nice wife. He'd been in about 20 years mm -hmm. uh, at that time. Okay. So then do you know what he did during the war, or did he, not t did he not tell you that? You know, I don't have any idea. I should know, but I don't. Okay. All right. Uh, now, when you did go uh, to sea in Japan, was it just for training exercises like that invasion, or did you transport things back and forth? No, we uh, we had two different operations. The one was the uh, Mount Fuji mm -hmm. experience. The other was we were down uh, on the inland sea of Japan, which is a very interesting and beautiful area. Uh, we went down there and went to a town called Kure, which no one's heard of. Um, when we left there, we went up to Buckner Bay, uh, where the uh, invasion, uh, come on. It's Okinawa. Okinawa. Yeah. That's exactly right, Jim. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and we were steaming darkened ship, uh, so no lights, no transmissions, I mean, just really be, trying to be stealthy. We were with six other LSTs and our squadron commander issued an order to turn Abel Obo uh, Zulu and that's a shackle code which they change every day. So our uh, first lieutenant looked it up and said well that's we're turning zero zero, one, or turning just one degree. And none of us gave it a thought, but the first letter, the alpha, was not a one, it was a nine. So we really should have turned 90 degrees. And the, the LST that was on our port stern broadsided us. And that's where Sap got mm -hmm. involved with, with his, his famous incident. But we took on quite a bit of water, and uh, we limped all the way back to Japan, mm -hmm. to uh, Yakuska, to a shipyard there, and got patched up. But that was a, an interesting experience. The bow, where the bow of that uh, LST came in, was through the stateroom behind mine. Um, and that particular officer had come off the duty and he was, he was not in his stateroom at the time or he could have really been seriously injured because mm -hmm. it went right through his bunk. Uh, but we got patched up enough that we could limp back to Japan and spent about six weeks in the shipyard. Now, on the different ships that you're with when you're out to sea, did you ever get into any bad storms or things like that? Or was the weather always okay? We never hit a tor uh, typhoon. Uh, it, it really was all right for us. Uh, we hit, you know, the worst weather we ever hit was in the Farallons, 
which is water just north of San Francisco. And there we broke our bow, our deck, main deck. Uh, we spent about 24 hours going three miles mm -hmm. at with flank speed, as fast as we could go, and we couldn't move. The winds were so strong. They just held us stationary. Mm -hmm. uh, but nothing out in the Pacific. We were very fortunate. All right. Uh, so now when does the visit to Japan, to Japan end? When does what? When, when do you finish in Japan? Uh, finished in Japan in... Uh, 1955. Okay. Um, was that sort of the end of your enlistment at that point? It really was. Uh huh. Yeah. In fact, I had a date. Yeah. From, we were in Japan from '54 to '55. Mm -hmm. Got back to San Diego, and I was discharged in March of '55. Now, did they make any effort to encourage you to re-enlist? Oh, yes. All right. Oh, sure. Well, what do they offer? Well, I was very, very tempted. I loved the Navy. Mm -hmm. Enjoyed every minute uh, of that experience. Um, they didn't offer really any incentives okay. other than, hey, it's a great life and stay with it. Mm -hmm. But right about that time I met and then married a girl in San Diego. Mm -hmm. Bad mistake. Uh, so that made the decision easy as far as not staying in the Navy. Okay. Her father was a career naval officer, mm -hmm. and uh, she never saw him. You know, for years, it seemed one or two months of the year, mm -hmm. and she said, I don't want that kind of a life. And I didn't either at that point. Okay. Now, did you go find a job someplace, or what did you do once you got out? Went back to Newton, Kansas, joined my brother, mm -hmm. who was in the oil business, he, with his father-in-law, mm -hmm. and we spent, uh, I spent just about six months there, uh, where my wife had her first child, and then Left, uh, left my brother. Just wasn't enough room for three of us mm -hmm. in that business. Yeah. So then I moved up to Kansas City and joined the Marley Cooling Tower Company. The water cooling towers, have you ever heard of them? No. You remember Three Mile Island? Yep. Okay, those were Marley Towers. Oh, okay. So to cooling towers for nuclear reactors. For uh, any, any process that generated heat. Okay. They would cool with water, and we would then cool the water enough that it could be recirculated mm -hmm. rather than wasted. So uh, we were basically water conservation devices. Okay. And how long did you stay with them? About 20 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I thought I'd be with them my whole career, but I wasn't. Did they run out, did they go out of business, or did you just move on? I moved on. Uh, I moved, we moved from uh, Kansas City, where Marley headquartered. Uh, I got orders to go to our Chicago office as a salesman, mm -hmm. and, which was a good deal, because that's where the money was, was in sales, and mm -hmm. uh, so it, it worked out very well. But it also meant a move to Chicago from Kansas City, which we loved Kansas City. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was a tough move. But then I spent uh, 13 years in Chicago and then was going through a divorce and came to Grand Rapids one night, have dinner with our distributor, and met my wife. Uh, just Instant, mm -hmm. instant chemistry. It was really, really amazing. So I've been in Grand Rapids ever since. All right. Okay. Still representing Marley. Mm -hmm. uh, we got into the, I started my own company, and we got into the computer room 
air conditioning and cabling business, along with the cooling towers. Okay. Two very diverse products, but both very successful. So I, I was really blessed. Okay. Now, to look back at the time that you spent in the Navy, uh, what do you think you took out of that, or how did that affect you? I matured a whole lot. I was kind of a wise ass, I guess, smart aleck. Uh, I was always very young for my class and age. Mm -hmm. uh, went to school when I was four and graduated when I was 19. So it, I just wasn't wasn't real mature. Mm -hmm. And I think I compensated for that by, you know, trying to be kind of a smart aleck. Uh, so I felt that the Navy really was a time of maturing for me. Okay. Well, did you take the smart aleck thing with you into boot camp? I mean, did you act Probably like that? not. Okay. I don't recall that at all, because uh, I was trying to earn some respect at that okay. time. And I was an older person coming out of college. That's true. Yeah. Okay, so by then you kind of figured out, okay, I have to do things differently. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. right. Take some responsibility. All right. Now to think back at the, about the time that you spent in the Navy, are there other particular memories that stand out for you that you haven't brought into the story yet? Or, Anything you've got in your notes that we haven't covered? Yeah, my reserve time. Oh, okay. Yes, let's talk about that. Jim, I went into the reserves as soon as I graduated or was discharged. <clears throat> went to a Naval Reserve uh, battalion down in Wichita, Kansas. Moved back to Newton mm -hmm. in the oil business. Right, right. Went to Wichita. When I moved to Kansas City, then I transferred to a reserve base up there. Mm -hmm. Uh, was there for six years, came to, well, let me think, yeah, boy, I'm fumbling, Wichita, Kansas City, hmm. and I think what you finished in, in Chicago, in Chicago. Okay. yeah, uh, when I was in Chicago, we cruised, cruised, we went to a drill, once a month at the foot of Randolph Street in the Naval Armory, mm -hmm. and then went out for two weeks active duty for training every year on different ships. So I was on carriers and cruisers and just uh, uh, all kinds of ships. Great experiences. Okay. Now you were in the reserves through the Vietnam era. Was yes. there ever any prospect of being called up? Or Not really. Okay. No. Uh, felt, I felt very secure during that time. Um, now, were there people in the, the Naval Reserve at that point who were younger ones who were there to stay out of Vietnam that you noticed? or Because it was a standard dodge that people would have they, to avoid the draft. If they could get into a reserve unit mm -hmm. or a guard unit, then they wouldn't go. Jim, I suppose there was some of that. I wasn't really aware. Okay of it, but I'm sure there was some draft dodging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a bad time during it. Okay. Now, which of the um, sort of your training stints kind of stand out for you? As you mentioned going to Jamaica once. Yeah, that was a wonderful trip. Uh, yeah, we picked up a, a ship in uh, New Orleans and then took it to Jamaica and spent a week there, and then back to to uh, New Orleans again. Uh, had some very interesting cruises. Uh, several of them were off San Diego because of my wife. Mm -hmm. Being from San Diego, she wanted to get out near her folks mm -hmm. and uh, we'd take the kids out there. Uh, but those were were great experiences, and uh, our company had to give me the time off. That was a requirement, mm -hmm. so I had kind of double vacation. Uh, it was a a good experience. I probably took a dozen different uh, active duty for training cruises. Uh, all of them different. All of them fun several in the San Diego area, uh, 
uh, well, the New Orleans to Jamaica. That was a highlight. Mm -hmm. Were they all um, working out of ports in the U.S.? Yes. Okay, so they didn't send you to the Mediterranean or something like no, that? No, no, they were all out of the U.S. Um, and we really didn't have much to do mm -hmm. on those cruises. I'm, I can express disappointment at our lack of creating valuable time or using the time well. It was just kind of a vacation. Mm -hmm. uh, so. All right. Uh, I think then that, that probably pretty much finishes out the story here. So. Yeah, kind of. Okay. Kind of brings us up to date. All right. When I married Bernie, my wife, uh, in '74, and moved from Chicago to Grand Rapids, then I dropped out of the mm -hmm. reserves. I just felt like I'd had enough. By then, I was a full commander, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the jobs were very limited. Uh, so I decided to get out of the Navy. Okay. All right. Well, it makes for a good story. So thank you for taking the time to share it. Today. Oh, you're welcome. I had made a, a calculation this morning, just for the heck of it, of how much I have made in the re reserves. And when I first joined the reserves, it was partly because I just needed the money badly. Uh, and we got one full day's pay for every drill you attended, every reserve drill. But I figured that I had 18 years of that reserve at about $700 a month. Um, the, that was uh, for the cruises, about $700. And then I had, uh, I've had a total of 52 years of uh, Navy retirement, about $1,200 a month, so that's another $81,000. So it, it's been very, very attractive mm -hmm. and uh, rewarding. All right. Okay, well, I just we won't tell the budget hawks then that we're spending all this money on you, but <laughs> all right. Well, I appreciate it, Jim, okay. very much. Yeah. <clears throat>